Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here along with intern Haley. And uh, Haley, we got great reviews on Haley's Heroes. And I think the, the masses want to also hear you sing the Haley's Heroes jingle. So we will be doing that a little bit later in the show. We're going to have more of Haley's Heroes that you have investigated deep into the draft all the way to potential UDFAs for analytics. And people think I'm kidding. We are not kidding that you actually have done that. Uh, so we will have a few more players to kind of look at that could be analytically sound. But we actually have a rumor to discuss. Are you, I mean, it's been a while. I feel like we haven't had any hot rumors. We've got Trey Lance rumors. Are, are you pumped? Are you excited? We can talk about a real rumor. I know. Yeah, it's exciting. Like actual news coming out. You don't hear much of that. And especially like right before the draft, that's not on a draft player. So pretty exciting. Um, definitely an interesting one that could go either way, but yeah. All right. We'll break it down. So Ian Rappaport reported that the 49ers are receiving calls, but not shopping Trey Lance. Interesting that they would put it out there that they're receiving calls though about Trey Lance. And uh, then uh, pro football talk also said that the Vikings had some Trey Lance related discussions. So let's just start there. Would you trade the 23rd overall pick for Trey Lance? Yay or nay, Haley? Uh, I would not. No. If you're keeping Kirk Cousins, then I'd say don't trade the 23rd just because that's like the same thing as taking a Hendon Hooker or a Will Levis at number 23. You're essentially, I don't want to say wasting a draft pick, but if you want to go all in one more time with Kirk Cousins and you're trying to fix the defense and you still got Justin Jefferson and everything, and then you waste, I don't want to say waste, but like, you know, like you waste a 23rd pick on a quarterback who might be a project who might not even be great. And he's going to be sitting for a year. So that quarter or that pick could be used on like a premium player uh, that could help this team win now. And I think if you're trading 23 for Lance right now and keeping Kirk, that's not the best idea. Okay, so what about the scenario where you trade 23 and then after June 1st, when it's more favorable for the cap, you trade away Kirk Cousins to someone else who didn't draft a quarterback? Let's even say, let's just say the Houston Texans, for example, they take an edge rusher and they've got Davis Mills as their quarterback. And then all of a sudden there's, a, I guess, tangential San Francisco connection with Kirk Cousins to the Houston Texans because of D'Amico Ryans. Let's just say they say, yeah, actually after June 1st, we would trade for Kirk Cousins here. Would you do it if Trey Lance was going to start 2023? If you believe that Trey Lance could start in 2023 and fit in this system, that's kind of been like a pure passing system. Like uh, Kirk Cousins is not a running quarterback and like Trey Lance kind of has that threat in him. So if you think that Trey Lance can fit in this system and you want to do a reset, if you don't think the defense could be like playoff caliber defense or maybe even like Super Bowl caliber defense, then fine. Like trade Kirk Cousins and see what you can get for him. Cause I don't know, you may be able to get a good amount for him and maybe try to get Trey Lance for not as much. So, but I definitely think I wouldn't give up the 23rd pick um, for Trey Lance and maybe try to get, or maybe trade something like later in the draft for him. I really don't know his value because he hasn't seen the fields at all. I know. And this is what's very hard is like uh, you being the numbers person have no numbers to work with, not even going back to college for Trey Lance because he only played the one year and then the COVID thing happened and he didn't even get an opportunity to even have a second season in college to give a bigger sample size. And then he has played so little that how are we supposed to draw anything? Now the Vikings did see him in training camp practices last year. So they would have some sense for what he looked like against their defense. But you bring up a very interesting point about where this fits in the timeline. So Kirk Cousins at the moment is the Vikings quarterback. In this offseason, they have brought in players who could kind of be for now and later, like Marcus Davenport, like uh, you know Byron Murphy, the, Josh Oliver. These guys could work out for them in the future and in the present. There hasn't been, though, a very clear teardown and there hasn't been a very clear all in nature. It's almost like they've kind of waited around to see what happens with their own quarterback situation. Like, is anybody going to come trade for Kirk or are we going to draft somebody or what before they really decide what direction they are truly taking this team on their timeline? Or as Quasey says, time horizon, 
What an awkward place to be on April as we record this 19th, where there has not been a real true decision about their direction. Yeah, it's definitely a weird scenario that they're in. And I don't think it's like a true ideal scenario because the quarterback position is up in the air and you never want the quarterback position to be up in the air. But as far as like trading for Kirk Cousins, like as a Jets fan, I actually wanted to trade for Kirk. And I think he could have gotten this team like pretty decent before the whole Aaron Rodgers situation happened. But I think he's still a solid quarterback. And he, if he's on the 49ers, like I think they win a ton of games. And we'll kind of talk about that later. But um, he's a great quarterback. And if the Vikings really don't think they can get there with their defense, with the offensive line they have or whatever, then I guess you got to trade him away, see what you can get for him. Well, and, and that's exactly right, that we talk about being stuck in the middle all the time with this Vikings team. And the Jets are not a team that's stuck in the middle. They're a quarterback away. And San Francisco, I, I mean, I don't know what Brock Purdy's going to be, but I do know what Kirk would look like with that team. And I think it would be enticing to Kirk to go there. I think it would be enticing for San Francisco to have him if they could work it out. However, it would his contract isn't easy to fit there, but it got easier with the restructure to fit, which also could have been a part of that that we didn't really consider. And if it was, I take back everything I said about restructuring the dead cap and everything else. If the reason was to lower the cap to trade him after June 1st, then I apologize for any criticism that I offered for that. But to me, the future is now. I remember when they traded for TJ Hawkinson that I had a very um, over-the-top rant talking about why you need to go all in and make a trade here. And I said, because there's no future. And right now it feels like, well, there really isn't for this year. There, it was the reason to go all in last year was because it wasn't going to happen again. And so now it's like, well, there is no future right now. Can you make one you, right? Instead of just having this weird situation where you have a quarterback who's a lame duck, who, you know, like has already kind of shown what he is. Can you get the ball rolling on the future now? And I think what we've learned at least through this, that I think is a very good sign is that that's how they're thinking that they're talking to San Francisco about Trey Lance at the combine, according to this report, like that's good. That shows their awareness of, we know that this is tenuous and we're going to have to start going in a quarterback direction very soon. Yeah. I'm glad they kind of had that realization because, you know, like some teams out there will be stuck in the middle for so long and wonder like why they can't win. I feel like that was almost like an Andy Dalton in Cincinnati type of thing. Um, And they finally kind of got out of that drafted Joe Burrow and, here they are now. So who knows the Vikings could end up doing that later on. Right. And I think that what Trey Lance would do in a trade is not preclude you from drafting someone else next year if you have to. And that is why getting it, getting the ball going right now and, and why I would be totally for this, get the ball going now. And if you end up like Miami who traded for Josh Rosen, it didn't work. And then they drafted Tua. like that's a, that's a pretty good scenario for you. Uh, speaking of scenarios, there are many and I wrote them down. And so I want you to rank the quarterback scenarios now that we can officially put Trey Lance in the bucket, I I think of possibilities for the Vikings. I've held out on this for a long time. Didn't think it was realistic, uh, but now it seems like it actually is. And it's something that they're really considering. So here's the options for the Vikings at quarterback as it stands trading for Trey Lance, drafting Hendon Hooker or Will Levis with the 23rd pick waiting until 2024 going back to Kirk Cousins with a three-year extension or completely panicking. No, I didn't write that. Uh, Drafting a mid-round developmental quarterback is the other one, not completely panicking. Um, But uh, how would you rank those potential options for the Vikings? So I'd probably start with the Kirk three-year extension, just because if you want to win now and you don't want to give up on Kirk and you feel like you can fix the defense, then you got to stay with Kirk. If you think this defense can be great and like, who knows, they might think the defense can be great, but then again, they're like calling about Trey Lance potentially. So then you might not think the defense is great, but if they think the defense is going to be decent and they add some players in the draft and fix this team to where they could be like, like far in the playoff caliber type of team, then I'd probably say Kirk with a three-year extension first. Okay, so how do you rank the rest of those options? Let's say that that's off the table. Let's say that they've decided we're not doing that. And let me just uh, further that point, that if we we all thought that the defense was close enough to fix because they had had the money to do it, the players, the recent draft picks to do it, I I would put that first potentially, maybe not. I don't know. I've seen too many many eight and eight kind of ish seasons, but 
Uh, but let's even say like that, that would be the argument for it. I just feel like they're so far away from that. And the fact that they don't have a wide receiver too, they still could use that. The running back situation is unclear. The edge rusher situation is unclear. The cornerback room is empty. Yeah, we don't know if Lewis scenes coming back uh, and is going to be a start. Like there's just so many questions there. Um, but if you could see within that window and the, there's also that element of keeping Justin Jefferson, which is another part of it. If Jefferson wanted to keep Kirk, then maybe you're saying, all right, let's give the extension. Let's fix the defense in one year and go forward from there. That one is probably second to last on my list because, <laughs> well, because I think it's just time to move on. I also think that anytime you're talking about a quarterback in his mid thirties, who isn't Aaron Rodgers, you are just risking a lot. And if you sign him to a three-year extension, it blows up in your face. Then you are so far off. You're going to have passed up on all these other opportunities. How would you rank the rest of them though? I'd probably say second. I mean, you make a great case, but I'd probably say second, you're draft or not drafting. You're trading for Trey Lance as long as you're getting rid of Kirk Cousins. I don't think they can be on the same roster. So if like getting rid of Kirk is a thing that's kind of known and that they're going to do, then I'd trade for Trey Lance, whether that's flip-flopping him or Kirk, whatever the scenario is, like trying to get a later pick. As long as you're not giving up 23 for Trey, for Trey Lance, I think that's a good scenario. I'd say third, I'd say wait until 2024. Um, who knows? Like, I don't think with the roster that they have now and if they keep Kirk Cousins, I don't think they'll at all be in the running for the first and second pick, likely where like Caleb Williams, Drake May are going to go. So do they want to trade their whole future for that and like make Justin Jefferson happy if he wants to stay at that point? That's a big question mark. So that's why I have that three. And then at four, I have drafting Hendon Hooker or Will Levis. Essentially, that's a, a similar thing as like trading 23 for Trey Lance because you're wasting a draft pick if you're keeping Kirk. Um, but those two quarterbacks need to sit for a year, so you kind of have to keep Kirk. Um, that's kind of the weird thing with those. And then finally, I have drafting a mid-round quarterback. I think it's like a decent option, but like mid-round quarterbacks usually don't work out unless you're like a Dak Prescott or Russell Wilson or something like that. So I don't think there's great mid-round options this year, and I think all of like the quarterbacks – from like Bryce Young all the way to like Hendon Hooker will go maybe in the first round. So we'll see about that. But yeah, that's kind of where I have them. No, I agree. And I think I would have, I might have Trey Lance number one, uh, like you said, contingent on moving Kirk Cousins after June 1st when it's favorable uh, for the salary cap. Uh, they have to have a team that's ready to buy though, because what happens as we saw from the Cleveland Browns is usually if people know you have to trade someone, they are not very willing to give you all that much. So make sure that you got your ducks in a row with that because they can't cut Kirk Cousins. You have to trade him in his scenario, not like with Baker Mayfield where they were just able to kind of cut bait with him and he could go elsewhere uh, if they wanted to. But I mean, in, the, in this situation, even if you're not getting much back for Cousins, you have to make sure that you're going to have suitors for him that will trade for him, start him, so forth. So you're not sitting Trey Lance or have it, or or sitting Kirk. That would be absurd yeah. to have like Trey Lance and Kirk Cousins. It would be, and also Trey Lance would come here and be like, "Wait a minute, haven't I seen this one before? Isn't this like Jimmy G behind me?" So there has to be some sort of deal in place, and maybe it is with San Francisco to make a trade before the draft and then send Kirk back after June, or maybe get future draft capital as opposed to this year. I don't know. There's a lot of moving parts to that. Uh, I think that is a better option because you brought up something interesting about with Hendon Hooker, you do have to wait a year because his leg doesn't work. And yeah. if you, okay, you wait a year, but it's a purgatory year. It's the ultimate, what are we even doing here kind of year? Why are we still together with Kirk Cousins if we've just drafted his replacement? And are you really competing for a Super Bowl? Not really, not at all. And uh, so you have to wait till the future begins where with Trey Lance, the future begins today. So I think I do like that option as being favorable. Do you think any of this happens? I mean, 2024 would have to happen if Kirk goes. Anything else other than wait till 2024 happens? I would probably say I, I don't see any other quarterback other than Kirk Cousins or Trey Lance being the starter for next year. It really depends on like, if San Francisco wants to roll with Brock Purdy as like their future. I mean, he was kind of great, but he's like a limited quarterback. And I feel like he can never be that like Patrick Mahomes type of player. So do they want to like gamble on Purdy for the future? Or do they want to gamble on Trey Lance for the future? And you don't really know what you have in him. So 
I think if they get a good enough deal, they'll trade away Trey Lance and they know what they have in Brock Purdy already. So I don't know. It's I feel like it's all kind of on them right now and what they get. So here's a question for you, because I, I struggle with this myself. Um, let's say that your assignment, your intern assignment was you have to give a definitive opinion based on quantitative something on whether it's a good idea to get Trey Lance. How would you approach it? Because I got nothing. I mean, I saw three practices of Trey Lance. I was like, wow, he's very large. And that was my whole takeaway. I'm sure that they tracked them. I'm sure they had data on them. And I'm sure that they watched them back closely, knowing that this could be a potential possibility or something with Trey Lance, uh, or at least just as a scout, knowing that they were going to play him a year from that moment. So they probably have something quantitative on him. How do we go about figuring out whether Trey Lance can be good or not? Because the only thing I got right now is it's weird that San Francisco would be willing to give away if they are. And, and that's not the report. But if they are, it's a little weird. That's the most quantitative I can get. <laughs> yeah, because there's like, what, two games out there over his like first two years? You really can't go off of just two games. That's like the lowest sample size ever. And then he didn't even play a ton in college. So, yeah, there's not much, like, stats you can go off. Like, you can't look at his PFF grade from one game and be like, all right, he's got a 90 grade or he's got, like, a 60 grade, whatever it was. I don't think it was great. So I'd probably say, yeah, like, you got to look at the practices and anything, like, as recent as you can get with him. But there's not a lot of numbers out there. Yeah, I think really it's only – do you believe that he can turn the physical tools into something? And I don't know how you figure that out uh, with so little of a sample size, but it might be anybody's guess. I think that would be the only hesitant point though, is if I'm Quasi calling them and trying to figure this out, I'm asking, okay, explain to me why you're doing this though. Explain to me why you're giving us. And if the answer is, oh, well, we know that Brock Purdy is going to be great. I don't know if I'm buying because it doesn't make any sense. Otherwise, they have no incentive to move him unless they just think that it's not going to work out. So very, very, uh, very tricky situation for the Vikings. But if they did it, would be all in on the idea because it starts the clock moving now toward who the next quarterback is going to be. And um, totally agree with you, though. If they were in a different position where the roster was mature, the defense was good and everything else, you'd be saying you should probably just give an extension and figure this out later. But that doesn't really seem like where they are. So here's a question for you. Another question related to this because we actually got something fun to work with today. Uh, if the Vikings traded Kirk to the 49ers for Trey Lance after June 1st, how many games would each of the teams win? Like how many games is San Francisco winning with Kirk? How many games are the Vikings winning with Trey Lance? I would probably have the 49ers winning a ton, but that's if they like want Kirk Cousins and want him to play. If they just love Brock Purdy so much, then I don't see them sitting Kirk Cousins though. So that's a different right, thing. Right. Um, but if Kirk is starting on that team, I probably have them winning like at least 11 games. Like they'll get to the playoffs. He's a great quarterback, and I think he might even be an upgrade over Brock Purdy. I know he's, like, kind of old, so who knows. But their offense and defense are just so good, and, like, no matter who's on that defense, they're going to be great. So um, i probably have the 49ers winning a ton of games, probably, like, 11 and plus. Um, and the Vikings, it all depends on how Trey Lance is. If he kind of shows up how he played the two games last season, which weren't too great. I know one was, like, in the pouring rain, so you really can't even look at that either. Um, but if he kind of plays not as great as he was playing, um, then I'd probably say five games. I don't know. Like, it depends on how good the Bears are. The Lions are probably going to sweep you if, with Trey Lance. The Packers are a big question mark. So, like, division-wise is a big question mark, and who knows. But I'd probably have you winning, like, a lot, guess, a lot less games than last season. No, I mean, I agree. I, I mean, I think for San Francisco, it's a lock. You're winning 11 or 12 games because that team is so good. It's interesting that with Kirk, there's a little bit of Case Keenum, Kirk Cousins comparison here where, yeah, Case Keenum is not as talented, but there was some playmaking element to Brock Purdy that Cousins doesn't have. But Cousins is a better quarterback, I think, more accurate. Um, he could execute that offense. So you're probably, like you said, when 11 is a, is a fairly – solid conservative estimate with Trey Lance. If they won six games next year with Trey Lance, but he showed a lot of flashes, that would be a winning season in my mind. Because if you felt like coming out of that, you've got something here because whoever starts Trey Lance, 
it's going to take a year. He's not going to look unbelievable in his first year. And that's going to be the hard thing maybe for people to deal with if the Vikings did this is that just like a Josh Allen or even like a Justin Fields, we're probably getting to the end of that year and having this conversation of like, is he really the guy? Because I don't know. Jalen Hurts was the same way. After last year, everyone's ranking Jalen Hurts as the 23rd best quarterback in the league. And then they built it around him and then he takes the step. That's what you'd be looking for. It really wouldn't be about 2023. I think it's much more about 2024 if you were trading for Trey Lance, but you at least get him here, get him in your system, work with Justin Jefferson and see what you've got if he could be your franchise guy. But it's a really, it's that's always been a holdup in my mind. And maybe, maybe you don't agree with this. I don't know. I've always thought, do you really want to give San Francisco a better quarterback? <laughs> like they're in your conference and you're going to play them this year. That's always been a holdup, but it seems like maybe for the Vikings, if they're having those conversations with San Francisco, that Kwesi doesn't care about that. Like it's not our problem. Once he's gone, he's gone. I'd probably say like a question for this is what if it's like a Bears type of scenario next year where you win like one game, get like the first or second pick in the draft with Trey Lance and you think he's good. Like if he, like shows like flashes of being good and you think you can develop him. Do you take Caleb Williams or do you draft out? Cause I'd probably take Caleb Williams. I would take Caleb Williams. Yeah. That, yeah. that would be a Josh Rosen to Kyler Murray situation. And even if he did show flashes, if they, if they have Justin Jefferson and Christian Derrissaw on their team and win one game, then <laughs> it went bad. It went way bad. I mean, that's the thing, this roster for the Vikings, I've always thought is a great setup for a quarterback. So that would actually be a major advantage. You bring in Trey Lance. If you can't succeed with Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne's pretty good. Your tackles are amazing. Your quarterback or your coach is a former quarterback and has a good offense. I mean, if you can't succeed with that, then you're just not that good. And you know what you're doing next year. There's a major, major benefit for that. Um, so I, I want to get to some other things. We got some Haley's heroes, but I'm going to skip a little bit in the order just to bring up that Aaron Rodgers is not yet a jet. And uh, I don't know, like how many weeks is this? It, you keep telling me that this is going to happen and this keeps not happening. He's still not a jet. There was, I saw some rumor about the Titans. I get nervous, get nervous yet. No, not yet. I'm still happening. I'm not getting nervous. Um, Sauce Gardner had said, I think it was like today or yesterday that he talks to Aaron Rodgers like pretty regularly. So it's happening. <laughs> Don't worry. I say that every week, but um, yeah, it's been like what a month and a couple of days now ish month and a week. And uh, I didn't think it would go on this long. But if the Packers don't want their picks, like whatever, like the Jets will take a player at 13, 42, and 43, and we'll build up that roster, and then Packers can get picks next year, or the Packers can get picks next year, and um, it'll be just be good for the Jets to get more of a Super Bowl caliber, Super Bowl caliber roster um, for Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I think that um, if it does not happen by the draft. This uh, will this this bit will change from me just giving you a hard time to no seriously though is this happening uh, because I, if you're the Packers you know that this roster around Jordan Love is not that good and they need draft picks so you're not getting 13th overall you've mentioned that I totally agree with you but they've got a couple other picks down the road from that they need them like the Packers need them. And they also need to be rid of Aaron Rodgers and move on toward the future in the same way we're talking about Kirk. Like there's value in just knowing what you're doing and having Aaron Rodgers still hang around in existence is not good for the guy who's going to, by the way, he's going to have OTAs. He's going to have uh, mini camps and Jordan loves going to go out there and go, well, I guess I'm a starter. Am I? Is it right? Is Aaron going to show up at camp or something? So they need to get this done soon, but until they do, it will always be a question in the rundown. When is Aaron Rodgers actually going to be a New York Jet? Uh, so let's move on to some Haley's heroes. Haley's heroes. So before you give some of your, uh, if you missed the last episode, you have targeted some analytically intriguing players in the draft that you're given breakdowns of. This is also uh, your article as well. That by the time people listen to this will be up. Um, so let's run through some more Haley's heroes. I've also made some Matt's monsters as well on my list. I've got some players that have caught my eye in the draft. So before you do it, you have to sing the jingle and then you can start breaking down your players. Okay. <laughs> Haley's heroes in the draft. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> sure. Okay. That that's, that is to the standard of this podcast when it comes to singing. That'll work. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm, so I'm who's a singer? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, well, I clearly am. So uh, unfortunately, that is a demerit on your report card as an intern. But um, <laughs> what was your first Haley's hero? Um, so I'll start with a day two hero. Uh, and it's Andre Carter, the edge player out of Army. Um, so I always went to Army football games as a kid. My grandparents had like season tickets. So I love Army football. And they had a guy who was basically their entire defense last season and in 2021. Uh, he had a 93.4 pass rushing grade uh, two seasons like in 2021, and that was his best season. And since Army is such a simple football team, every opposing offense game planned as if Andre Carter was the only player on defense. So that's why his production like wasn't as great this past season, but he still graded like in the mid 80s uh, for pass rushing and his defensive grade and everything so, like with everyone targeting only him so in the nfl like that's not going to be the case like you're going to be on a defense and everyone's a threat so it's not just you so that's why i think he's going to be a really good player in the nfl and he had uh made a bunch of strides in run defense this past year while his like pass rush wasn't as great um so if he puts all the pieces together i think he can be a great player and he just needs to get like a little more like stronger but he's like the on the strongest team and most and most athletic team in the country in army. So I don't see any way he's not a stud in the NFL. Um, so Andre Carter is, I think what, like six, seven. Um, he has like some crazy wingspan. I'm trying to look this up, but yeah, he's, he's six foot six and 256 pounds. He did not have the most insane combine, but he does have a crazy wingspan. And another thing that's interesting that stands out was his quickness numbers, uh, because not all of the combine things make sense for everybody. But for someone who's six foot six and a half, 250 pounds, and has the type of short area quickness that he has, just from those combine scores, pretty impressive. He isn't as refined of a player as you're going to find at the very top when it comes to pass rushers, but as a day two pick for the Vikings, a team that needs to find more of these guys. Yeah, that's really interesting. And his 2021 season is hilarious to look at. It's just like tons of sacks, tons of pressures, and then everybody paid attention to him. But because he didn't have the same production last year, that could lead to him being available in the second round. So he, yeah, he is a, an intriguing guy for either that third round pick or if the Vikings were to... Uh, trade back. Let me throw back at you a Matt's monster. Uh, one of Matt's monsters. I've got an edge rusher too. Will McDonald, the fourth out of Iowa state. Now he is the opposite undersized six foot three, 235, 240 pounds, but had an unbelievable combine great production to Iowa state. And they were not using him all the time as an outside linebacker. They were just lining him up over tackles. So to get that same production in something that's maybe not the best for him, I thought was really impressive. How do you like edge rusher for the Vikings? I mean, I think that it's a position of need here if they have to move on from Zadarius Smith or Daniil Hunter. And there's a lot of guys, it, these two, the Haley's heroes, the Matt monsters, they're like one of 10 that sort of fit this bill of maybe imperfect, but also kind of freakish athletically in some way. I, I think it's a good draft to kind of need one in the back end of the first round. Yeah, I think so. Like, you can never have too many edge rushers. Like, you can always rotate them and have them all do their thing and be fresh for the next snap. So it's a great position to take, and the earlier that you can get them, almost like the better. Um, there's a lot of undersized ones, like, later in the draft. So who knows if they can be great, like, with their size in the NFL because, I don't know, if you're, like, six foot – like, there's one who's, like, six feet tall, like, not even that heavy. And, yeah, he had, like, the best production at, like, San Diego State or wherever he was. But – like how well is that going to translate to the NFL if you're like a little under six foot for an edge rusher? Right, right, right. And I think, I mean, this is where like Brian Flores and kind of what he prefers. Does he prefer the smallish guy he can move around? Does he prefer more of a, you know, an, a traditional type of edge rusher like Andre Carter? Uh, I guess we'll find that out. And maybe I need, do I need a song too? Like uh, metal? Like, yeah. Mets yeah. monsters. <laughs> Football. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that'll work. Uh, so who is your next Haley's hero? <laughs> so I've got Keaton Mitchell running back out of East Carolina. Um, no one ever thought that like 7.4 yards per rush is possible, but he made that uh, happen. And I don't know how he did. Uh, I mean, he's at East Carolina. He's not playing like the biggest competition out there, but he's had nearly 2,500 r rushing yards since, uh, since 2021. Um, one of the highest running or one of the highest rushing grades 
in all of college football last season. He didn't fumble. He had 50 rushes of 10 plus yards. I think that led the NCAA. So just amazing running back. Um, like kind of not so great about him is he's a horrible pass blocker. He's just five foot eight, kind of like a Deuce Vaughn, but like a li- little taller. Um, so he's just getting like trucked by these defenders if he's pass blocking. So that's not great. Um, but his rushing production is like unmatched. Uh, he stuck out to me as well because he averaged, I think a half a yard more rushing than Tanner McKee did passing. And that just doesn't happen that often. Uh, Tanner McKee has very much Daniel Jones vibes of somebody who just keeps checking down all the time, but he can't actually run. But Keith Mitchell is an intriguing one because this again is, I think got some strengths as a draft of where the Vikings should be picking these types of players. So a running back in the first round, you know, we talk about, it's just not really a thing they need to do, but in the mid rounds, there's a bunch of guys who are like this. Uh, Keandre Miller, I think is the guy from TCU. There's Eric Gray from Oklahoma. Like there's, there's probably five to seven. You mentioned Deuce Vaughn players who could be contributors in the fourth, fifth, type of rounds at the running back position. And this is why we talk about not drafting them high. And I was intrigued as well. If a guy averages seven and a half yards per carry kind of reminds me a little bit of like Kareem Hunt, where Kareem Hunt went to leap to Toledo, had insane numbers and then ended up working out. So I think that that falls in the area of the draft where teams actually should be targeting running backs. Yeah, definitely. Like if you're getting a player in the later rounds who could just be plugged into a system and chug along, then I think you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I think so too. Um, let's see. Hold on. I have to call up information on my next Matt's Monster because I closed this out, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Matt's Monsters. Uh, let's see. Kobe Turner uh, from Wake Forest. As we know, Wake Forest constantly producing great defensive tackles. I'm just, just kidding. I don't know. Who's the best Wake Forest football player? I no idea. Somebody will come up with that and help me out. This guy has crazy numbers though by PFF. He graded an 88.8 pass rush, 93.1 on run defense, elite pass rush win rate, elite when it comes to the amount of hurries, hits, sacks, totals for two straight seasons. Not somebody who's really being talked about at all and is kind of the right tweener for the Vikings at 6'3", 290 uh, that could play like a five technique. And this is something that in the past I never really looked at. 6'3", 290 was, all right, he's off the board. The Vikings are not going to pick him. But for this guy, you know, maybe that's possible. And uh, he's kind of projected as a mid-round type of player. But I think when we're doing our our heroes and monsters here, we're looking for guys who have really intriguing analytic traits that may not be uh, the highest on the radar, but could be kind of steals because of it. So I am looking at Kobe Turner. And I think it's just in general, the Vikings really need an interior pass rusher, whether it's high or whether it's you know trying to find someone to develop. So that is my Matt's monster. I didn't look at his relative athletic score, but uh, I like what I see there. Yeah, like interior like defenders can be great. And I like Kalaja Kansi, who's a first round like projected talent now. And I don't know if he falls to the Vikings at 23, but he could be a potential option for them there. He's like outstanding in his stats. And I don't know, I think he'd be a decent fit if he's there. Some things are funny to look at, like this guy's broad jump was horrendous and yet his three cone was incredible. Like, how does that happen? How is he, how is he really good at a three cone, but he can't jump anywhere? I don't know. What does it, what does this tell us about football? Uh, what do you got? You got one more? I've got uh, two more. Okay. So the first is actually a first round talent wide receiver, Jordan Addison. Um, I didn't like look too much into his stats because it's like Jackson Smith and Jigba is like the top receiver in this draft. Everyone thinks that, and maybe even like a Quentin Johnson or whatever. Um, But uh, Jordan Addison, like his stats are really, really, really good. And I wasn't like thinking that Um, he did like, like Josh Downs, who's from North Carolina, because we talked about him last week. He also had like an NFL caliber quarterback throwing to him in Caleb Williams. So he's already got that kind of experience. He knows what NFL quarterbacks are, are, are kind of like. Um, but he also averaged 7.3 yards after the catch per reception. That's insane. Like far more than any other receiver that I've looked at in this draft. So I have him a little bit above Zay Flowers just because of that stat. Um, he also has 146.7 passer rating when targeted. That's near perfect. So he's kind of insane um, and should be a great fit for whatever team wants to take him uh, probably to like mid end of first round. I actually thought last year when Kenny Pickett came out, 
that Jordan Addison made Kenny Pickett in a lot of ways because Pickett was like a one and that's not true for Caleb Williams, but that was because he was a one year kind of hero. It was, Oh, well, this is because he's got this great wide receiver. So I, that's a guy that I have consistently gone back to at the 23rd pick that I don't think he's quite big enough to get drafted much higher than that. And he could be around in that range. Great for a number two wide receiver. He does have enough flaws physically, just not being the biggest guy, but he's lightning. I mean, he's really hard to catch like quick route runner, all those things. I, I like him a lot as a player. He would be a Matt's monster if he wasn't a Haley's hero, because I think, I think that's a great pick, but also I hadn't looked deep into his numbers like you did. Um, and I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, they came out pretty well. So one more for me is I don't think this guy's actually a good fit, but I really like him which is uh, Travis Hodges Tomlinson, which is uh, LaDainian Tomlinson's nephew, I believe. He's undersized, but there is just a place in these monsters' hearts. If you are undersized and you can put yourself on the map, I think there's something to that. The Vikings, first of all, don't really have a nickel. And maybe Byron Murphy's a nickel, I'm not sure. Uh, a lot of times, some of these guys can move inside and play nickel. We saw it with Antoine Winfield back in the day here. Uh, Nickel Roby Coleman was a good undersized nickel. Like there are corners who don't have to be the biggest. And even though he didn't play in a system that would be exactly like this. And I don't know, maybe people are concerned about TCU corners because one failed here. I don't know. People like that, but I just think he's a baller. I, I mean, I think he was a huge reason for their defense being capable enough to stop everybody enough, except for Alabama or not, or except for Georgia in the national championship game. But that team overachieved by a lot. He was their superstar of the defense, underrated, undersized. I like him as like a number, uh, like a third third round pick for the Vikings. Yeah, when I was kind of looking through corners, he wasn't in that like top like conversation. But his stats are like great. He had a thirty eight point two reception rate allowed and a forty passer rating against. So he's had those stats in college. So he could be kind of great in the NFL, um, given his size. But who knows? I'm glad you had those numbers in front of you. Cause I was like trying to pull them up. I, I had the, my list and I couldn't get them. So I just talked about him being short. Uh, who is your last Haley's hero? So we'll go with a quarterback, uh, day three quarterback, Clayton tune from Houston. I know like day three quarterbacks, they're kind of like inevitable. Like someone's going to take them and everyone's going to talk about it. But in reality, they're really never going to play and maybe see a couple games as a backup if the starter gets hurt or whatever. But he had the highest, Passing grade tied with uh, Bryce Young, who's going to be like the number one pick in the draft, probably. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, he's a stats kind of hero here. He makes big time throw after big time throw. At, he had 26 of those. Um, but just like his bad stats were, he turned the ball over, fumbling a good amount of time, 17 turnover worthy plays, and took 23 sacks. So, maybe you can clean that up in the NFL if a team really believes they can do that. But I don't know. Kind of cool quarterback with really good stats. Yeah, really good stats, really good athleticism. And I, I've been looking at these things that NFL.com does, these like next gen breakdown scores. And uh, there are NFL starters who on this one to a hundred scale got in the like low or the high seventies. And that's where Clayton Toon is because he got a really good athletic score uh, on this thing, not the relative athletic scores we usually look at, but he also scored well on that. And his production in college was very good too. Six two is a little undersized. I'm trying to figure out like, what are the big criticisms of the guy? And a, a lot of it is just that they feel like the scouts who watched him, that it wasn't getting the ball out quickly. It was not really reading defenses a whole lot, but the guy could certainly throw the ball. I look at him like maybe a Case Keenum type, and that's definitely tying together his university like I just made fun of people for doing. But not the biggest, maybe not the most unbelievable when it comes to arm or reading defenses or whatever, but there could be something there. And it's, I'm not saying necessarily worth a shot for the Vikings, but if they're looking for that developmental quarterback, maybe he's the guy that they look at because he does have really good numbers. So that is another Haley's Heroes, Matt's Monsters. We'll do one more before it's draft time. We'll make another list. Great stuff. And also people should check out your article because you have more details on day one, day two, day three. And just as a tease, 
a long snapper is also mentioned who has an incredible athletic profile. I don't know. That's actually true. Uh, so one more thing for you real quick. Uh, Ryan Leaf went on NFL Network today, and he really dropped some truth bombs on Bill Polian. Long story short, Bill Polian told a story about Ryan Leaf's pre-draft interview, and that actually never happened. So I guess Ryan Leaf never even did his pre-draft interview with the Colts. So I don't know what happened. I mean, Bill Polian's pretty old. Maybe he just missed remembered or something, but that's not the question. Uh, the question is you get like 20 minutes to sit down with each quarterback when it comes to, or each player, when it comes to the combine, you set up your interviews and whatever. Uh, if you had 20 minutes with some of these quarterback prospects that we've been talking about for the Vikings, what would you ask them? So I'd be like, Hey, we know your arm talent. We know your ability on the field. We've seen all of that. Why aren't you Zach Wilson. Like, why aren't you the worst decision maker in all of football? Like, I'd want to know what goes on in their heads, like when they're like making a play or something like that, because like, that's what you don't see on tape and everything like that. So I'd be like, why are you making better decisions than him? And like, why can't you be a bust in that type of category? Because I know what you can do on the field. Why aren't you going to be a bust is such an aggressive question. Like Minnesota, every Minnesotan just went like, Ooh, Oh, wow. Uh, the, the East is different. Um, that would be, that's such a, that's such a great, like, uh, you're from New Jersey question. Why aren't you a bust? <laughs> that's tremendous, but it's a good question though. Like, do they have an awareness to understand what needs to happen for them not to be a bust? Like Ryan Leaf was a bust because he wasn't mature enough to handle the pressures of being the top draft pick. It was a major reason. He just kind of freaked out. And Peyton Manning, I guess probably from birth, had been prepared to be an NFL quarterback by his NFL dad and all of his NFL friends. And the guy was ready to go day one and it never phased him. And the talent difference was probably nothing. And it was entirely that he couldn't handle it. And I guess that's what I would want to know as well. Like, what is some of the things that you go through in high school, college, whatever, that would prepare you for the NFL? Because I think what you want to hear, there's almost a, there's a, it's almost a lock that all the draft picks think that they're ready to play. They're like, oh man, like I'm good. Like I'm all set. I'm ready to get out there. And then a couple weeks into training camp, they're like, oh my God, this is so hard. This is so much different. So I guess I would want to look for an awareness of how much different it was going to be. I don't even know if I care as much about like them drawn on a whiteboard or not. I don't know how much that matters. Maybe it does more than I think, but I think it comes down to, can you actually handle all the pressure? And maybe it's not a coincidence. I think the New York thing is overrated. Maybe it's not a coincidence though. I don't know because there is so much pressure when you are the New York jets quarterback that they need to still be trying to trade for Aaron Rodgers because all these guys can't handle it. Exactly. Like, I don't like there shouldn't be as much pressure being a New York quarterback because the Jets and Giants have been so bad for so long that our expectations are so low. Like, you don't have to go out and be Patrick Mahomes in the first day, but just don't turn on the ball over like five times in the first half. Like, that's all I'm asking. Um, But yeah, I'd just be like, watch some Zach Wilson film, like watch some like horrible decision making throws and like tell me why you wouldn't do that and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's a really, that's a really interesting way to look at it. Uh, there's so many things that go into it. Uh, it is almost defies the odds that the Jets could draft as many busts as they did. Sorry about that. But uh, at the same time, you, you understand it because there are so many things that are different in the NFL than they are from college. Um, and maybe this is why in some of these meetings, they play rock, paper, scissors, because there's no way to figure it out. So they just do staring contests or whatever. I think it was, was it Nick Sirianni who was doing staring contests with these guys? It's like, I, I have know. no idea. <laughs> I initially thought Nick Sirianni is going to be this brutal coach because he's doing rock, paper, scissors or something with these players. But I guess that wasn't all they did. So anyway, maybe, maybe you'd ask them after the Will Levis thing, like what's your worst food opinion? And uh, you could judge off of that. Uh, okay. So any Vikings questions for me? Yeah, I've got one this week. So it's one week before the draft. Uh, what do you think the Vikings should do with number 23? Like your top option, if everything goes according to the to plan, like let's say the player you want falls or something like that, or you want to trade out of that pick, like what's the top prime option? Okay, if I'm being unrealistic, the top option is that 
Anthony Richardson falls far enough for them to trade up and draft Anthony Richardson. That is not realistic, but that would be number one on my list. If that doesn't happen, I think we actually just talked about it. It's probably draft Jordan Addison or someone of the like, whoever they want. I don't know. I don't know who's going to be better. Like Quinton Johnston can't really catch the ball, but he's kind of a beast. Like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that guy, give him the football, find a way. It's a receiver for me because I don't think you're fixing the defense today. I think it's going to be pretty rough. You need free agency money to do that. You just drafted poorly for so long. So you can make yourself a potentially elite offense. You can set yourself up to give the best possible situation to your next quarterback, whoever that's going to be. Get that started today. Draft a quarterback or draft a wide receiver for your next quarterback. I think still they're drafting a corner and that's going to be fine, but that's what I would do. How about you? How would you answer that question? I would probably like after looking through Jordan Addison's stats, I'd be like, oh, he's on the board. Like take him like because Smith and Jigma is not on the board. I probably doubt Quentin Johnson's on the board, but I think I'd want Addison over Johnson right now. Um, So I'd probably say him. And then I just love Deontay Banks so much, like such an athlete, such great stats. So um, yeah, I'd probably say one of those two guys right now. But if a team calls you like giving a first round pick for next year for like that pick, then I'd be like, oh, trade back. Like, why not? Yeah, of course. A hundred percent. There's kind of like these, these outlier scenarios where, yeah, if, if the new Orleans saints, for some reason, because they psychotically trade in the draft, want to do something crazy, then do it. But if not, I think we're on the same page. That's actually how you got the internship. That was the, the whole interview. I just said, uh, the, like, we're talking about interviewing quarterbacks. I just said, what would you do in the draft? And you said draft a receiver. Okay. You're hired. Come on in. <laughs> Um, so anyway, well, great stuff, Haley. Really appreciate that. And our next Haley's Heroes episode uh, is going to be right before the draft. And then we've got plans to pod like right after day three as well. So lots of Haley coming your way uh, to continue to break these things down as we go forward. So thank you for your time and thank you everyone for listening and we'll catch you later.